In this lecture, we're going to start talking about functions and how you can create your own functions. So you've been using functions a lot, uh, but so far we haven't really talked about how you can make them yourself. And it turns out it's pretty straightforward and it can be very useful in a lot of cases. As you move to larger and larger projects, you'll find that you are copying the same code and using it a lot and maybe tweaking just small pieces. And this can be across projects or even within a script for one project, you might find that you're using a copy and paste a whole lot. So some examples might include that you have a specific type of equipment that gives you data in a set format, and you always need to tidy that data up to get it in a tidy data format to work with the tools that we're using here. So in the past, I've had students who have been working with data from air pollution monitors and acceleram accelerometers. And um, in both of those cases, they had these first pre-processing steps that they needed to do, and they were always doing pretty much the same thing for the files they read in for that. Another is that you might be running and rerunning a specific type of analysis. So for example, fitting the same type of model or model format to lots of data sets that you're getting in. You also might find that you're very frequently creating a specific type of plot or a specific type of map. So for all of these, uh, if you don't know how to write functions, you would end up copying and pasting a lot of your code. So I wanna introduce you to the idea of writing your own functions so you can avoid doing that. The advantages that you'll get from that, first of all, coding is much more efficient because instead of having this whole chunk of code that you need to copy and move around, you've got just a line that you can call it in. And you can even put options in there so you can tweak the behavior some from time to time. Um, but it still can be done much more succinctly than if you were copying the whole initial piece of code. It also makes it a lot easier to change your code later. So maybe say that you have a function that does something and you realize later that you want to change part of that. So maybe you have a function that creates a plot that you want to use throughout a whole paper and you decide that it would look better with a different theme. Instead of needing to go to every place where you've copied and pasted that data, you can make the change to the code, adding on that, that different theme, you can make it just inside your function, and then when you rerun your code, it will rerun that function everywhere, so it's made that change everywhere. Finally, this makes it easier to share code with others. It really kind of encapsulates the ideas and the, the, the actions that you want to take into these discrete little functions where somebody can start by figuring out what main functions they use and then to learn more can dig into the code for those functions to really figure it out. I also think it's important as you're learning R to learn how to create functions so you can go in and read other people's functions and diagnose what they're doing. So that's kind of a side benefit of learning how to create them yourself. So we'll create functions and we actually create them and save them as an object. Um, the, the object will work a little bit differently than some of the other objects that we that we have created work. Um, in particular, after the, the name of the function, you'll put parentheses to indicate that you want to make a call to the function rather than just printing out the code that's in the function. Because they really are objects um, and being saved as objects with object names, you can name these anything that you want, but you need to follow the same rules that you use for naming any other R objects. So things like it has to start with a, a character. It can only contain characters, numbers, an underscore, a dot, and a few other special characters, but not many. Um, and that it might be to your advantage to name an all and lowercase, so you don't have to remember later what combination of upper and lowercase that you used. So this is the basic usage for um, how you'll create these. So you'll pick the function that you want to call it, and you'll put that on the left-hand side of your get zero, just as you would if you were doing things with a data frame or another data type of object and wanted to save that using an object name. Then on the right-hand side, we'll put function and parentheses, any of the arguments that we want to have, and then we'll put these curly brackets and put any code that we want to run inside those curly brackets. So I'm going to walk through these through examples so you can get a feel for how this works. And um, as a note, these curly brackets here, if we only have one line of code, we don't actually need those. What those are really doing is they allow us to group multiple um, lines of code together as one thing that can, should kind of be like evaluated as a whole. So it'll be pretty rare that you have a one line function 
Um, and we will always use the curly brackets in this class, even if we're doing a one line function, just to get in the habit of using them. It will never be a wrong thing to do. All right, so let's talk about the idea of a function that can add one number to a number that you put in. And I've got an example here, but we're going to start with something even a little bit simpler. So let's say that we have number as an object. And right now, let's say that we just have the number four there. So if we run this, we can see that that prints out that number. And then if we wanted to add one to that, we can do number plus one. Now, if we go back and we change this to like six, we can see that when we run this again, it's working with this number. All right, so let's say that we want to take a really simple function that does this action, just adding one. We can name that add one. And then we'll do this function piece for, first. This is allowing us to define a function. And inside of the parentheses, we'll put the arguments that we have. Right now, we're going to start with something really simple. We're only going to have one parameter, one argument, and that's number. Now we'll do curly brackets. And we can put what to do with that. So we're saying we're taking that number and adding one to it. What will happen is when we run add one, because we have number here without any default, we have to put something in for that argument. We can do what we started with and we can put number equals four, but we'll also be able to change this to other numbers. R will run through and it will run the code here as if it started by assigning number to the, the, the value that we put on the right hand side here. So it's as if it did this kind of step for assigning whatever option we put here, and then it'll run any of the code that we have inside those curly brackets for the function. All right, so we need to make sure that we run this to define the function. Now we can come down, and before we try running it, let's try just putting the function name without putting the parentheses. So if you do that, what it does is it actually prints out uh, the code that's inside that function. So it prints out that it's a function, the parameter that you can put in is number, and then here's the code that runs on the inside. If we want to run it, we need to do the function name and then parentheses after, and then if there are required arguments, we need to put those in. So if we do this, you can see that it's come down and it's done five. We could try doing a different number here. And we can come down and we can see that it's evaluated that. Um, because it takes a vector for this, so we can't do a single number, we, we, we're doing a vector, we could put in one to three. And you can see that it's added the numbers to all of those, just like it would if we came up in this kind of code and did like this. So it's really just letting us to take this process of assigning an object to a certain value and then running code based on that object. And it's letting us encapsulate it where we can pass in the assignment that we want to make through one of the parameters. And then we can put in all of the code and that will automatically get run when we run that function. So here's the example again of doing that and then using that function and applying it to the numbers one to three and then to the number negative one. And I should note as well, as we're doing this, if we want to, we can assign this to a new value. So we could do new number. And then if we wanna be really safe about what is being returned from the function, we can say exactly what object we want it to return. So the default is whatever it evaluates last, whatever expression that is, it will return that result. Um, but if we want to, we can be very, very specific and we can define the exact object we want returned and then use this return function to return it. So if we run that now, you can see that everything looks the same here, but this way we're being very explicit about what we want the function to give back to us after it's done running this code in the middle. All right, so a few things to note here, and this is going to be a little bit repetitive, but I think it's worthwhile really thinking how this is working. So I picked a name of the function, 
and I picked it as add one. So I picked what went on this side and I tried to follow the same rules of not picking something that already exists as a function name or another type of object in R and then uh, using all lowercase and using using the underscore to separate words and all of these other rules we've been trying to use when we define um, our object names in general. The only input in this case is a number and that parameter name is going to be number. Right now I haven't put a default, but we'll look later at how we could put a default here. Um, inside the code, this name refers to the name that I passed in right here. So whatever I assign for this when I run it, R will use when it gets inside the code. So here's another example. We might want to create a small function that fits a model that we want to use a lot. So we've been doing the World Cup data. We could do a function that fits the model of tackles regressed on time and position. And we might want to do it so we can pass in different data frames. So let's take a look at that. Let's come back here and do the fairway package so we can get the World Cup data. And let's also do tidyverse. All right, so when we're working with this World Cup data, again, let's take a look. We've got some different information on the team, the position, time, shots, passes, and so on. So if we wanted to do a linear model, let's see, we're doing a tackles regressed on time and position. We can again use this LM function with a formula interface where we say the dependent variable and then the tilde. And so that means that in this case, we're going to do tackles regressed on. And then we've got two independent variables. We're going to look at time, which is continuous, and position, which is a factor variable. And then we need to say uh, where we're getting the data. So in this case, we're getting it from World Cup. So if we run that, we get this kind of output that gives us information about the estimated parameters for that particular model. Um, so it's giving us an intercept, the estimate for the increase in number of tackles for every extra minute played, um, assuming that we're holding position steady, and then some information on um, how we expect these average numbers to differ for the positions of forward, goalkeeper, and midfielder compared to the, the base of that level of position, which in this case I think is going to be the defender just because alphabetically that came first. All right, so we might want to take this and create a function called fit time pause mod. It's kind of long, but we'll do that. All right, so again, we start just by doing function, and then we're gonna do the curly brackets to put our code in. So we wanna think about the part of this that we might wanna change. And right now, we'll just think about what if we wanna change this data frame that we send in. So instead of naming that uh, World Cup to pass in, let's say that we wanna make it more generic so that we can do a data frame. But maybe for the default, let's let the default be World Cup. So if we don't say anything else, this is saying use the World Cup data frame if we don't put anything else in here. Now we can take this part, but we need to make sure that we change this data part so that it's using the argument name right here. Sorry, the formal argument. So again, it's as if when R runs this, we're going through and assigning that DF is World Cup and then we're running this. So it's as if we're doing this and this. So now we can put this in. And if we run it, since we have this default value in here, we actually don't need to put it if we don't want to. So we can see that that's run it. We can also specify it explicitly if we want to. But we could also do something now, like we could, um, we could run it where we filtered this so that the team is maybe like France. So in this case, it's as if we've added this extra step here and run that and then again run this code. So again, what's going on, just to just to kind of like be very explicit about this, is this is assigning 
each of these arguments that will then be referred to in the code leader. So signing those. And then once we get into the code, it will use that and run any code we want to down there. Now, what we can also do with this, in this case, we are starting with the data frame. And so if we want to, we can pipe in. So piping is not just for functions that already exist. You can do it with any function. The only rule is what you pipe in here will get placed in as the first argument here. So it'll be as if you're doing df equals world cup. So we can pipe in like that. And then we can also pipe back out. So if we wanted to, we can do tidy from the broom package. And we can get this back into a tidy data frame. So you can see now we've got that tidy version where we've got this different information for each of the model parameters. Now with it this way, we can again go through and we can make some changes. So we can filter and do that the team, let's see, maybe let's do it in two different ones. So maybe that the team is either France or Spain maybe. And we can run that. So this gives us a lot of flexibility to go through and explore fitting that model to different combinations or subsets of our data. All right, so a few notes on this. Again, I picked a name of the function, and that's what I put over here. This one was kind of long. Um, but you get to pick this part just like you do when you're defining an R object, when you're assigning it to a name. In this case, the only input is, is a data frame. So in the example I was just showing in RStudio, I gave it a default value. So the default value is what it'll run if I don't put anything in the parentheses when I call it. Um, in this case, I, I'm not putting that default, so this would require that you specify something. Um, and then within the code itself, this, this argument name, gets referred to. And so then when you run the function, whatever you put in for that particular argument, it's as if R is assigned that to, that to that formal argument name, and then it uses it within the code that it runs. So again, this is just showing an example of how we could apply this once we've written it within a tidy pipeline. So a few rules about functions at this stage. Uh, first of all, functions can input any type of R objects. They can input vectors, data frames. They can even input other functions if you really want to get meta. Uh, they can input ggplot objects. So they've got a lot of flexibility in what they can take in. They can also input more than one argument. So, so far we've done these functions where we really only are putting one argument in, in here, but we'll look at some examples later where we'll put in multiple ones um, and we'll use commas to separate those. But anything can kind of go in in those arguments. They can also return just about any type of our object. But the, the, the part to remember is that it can't return multiple things. It can only return one R object typically. That's why lists are very popular for a lot of functions that need to return a lot of stuff in a lot of different formats because that list object lets you put those in as different pieces, kind of like in different slots and lets you send the whole thing out. Um, so that's why you often see those in things like statistical modeling functions. Last, you'll sometimes hear um, references to functions having side effects. So the main effect of any function is really to return an R object. But occasionally, you can write functions that do other things. You could write a function, for example, that um, creates and plots a plot. So in that case, it's doing something that you care about other than just returning an R object. And that's called a side effect. So in that case, creating the plot is a side effect. Uh, rather than kind of the main effect of the function. Generally, it's pretty good to write your functions either so, so you only want them to do their main job of returning an R object, or so that you only want them to do some side effect, like creating a plot. Um, it can get a little bit tricky if you try to write functions that are trying to both return an object and, and do these side effects. Um, it, it tends to be a little bit nicer to have it just do one or the other.